everyone. My name is Maite Rodriguez and I'm part of the Pi School team. Welcome to Pitch Day. Um, today we will get to know the outcomes of the latest edition, session nine already of the School of AI. For eight weeks, with a holiday break in between, our AI fellows, engineers, and specialists in artificial intelligence have been working relentlessly to tackle the business challenges that were posed to them and find viable solutions using AI. It has been an intense journey, working from different corners of the world, different time zones, but they all pull through. Throughout, they have also been coached by and mentored by experienced professionals adding to their learning journey. They have even been coached on personal branding and communication by Pi Schools communication expert, Lucia Bracci. But before we move on to the challenges and the pitches, I would like to invite Isabel Andrea, CEO of Pi School, to officially welcome you, fellows, sponsors, and guests to the event, and to tell you a little bit about how Pi School came to be and its mission. Isabel. Thank you, Maiti. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And I would like to welcome you all to this final pitch event and tell you how proud I am to present you the result of the ninth edition of another School of AI session. Once more, we have had the honor to host a remarkable group of fellows from around the world and have gained the trust and support of innovative businesses that understand the potential benefits of using AI in their operations and processes. Bicycle was founded in 1917 with the ambition to provide a nurturing environment and expert support for individuals uh, interested in pursuing professional careers in AI, to offer them opportunities for learning and to work hands-on real industry cases. In doing so, we also wanted to provide businesses and organizations ways to integrate AI and help them solve and optimize some of their challenges. And not only concentrate on the technology needed to innovate and generate value and impact, but also on the creative and entrepreneurial aspects that help ideas become profitable and successful enterprises. Pi School is the educational offspring of Pi Campus, which was founded by Marco Trombetti and, uh, and myself and I in uh, uh, 2016. With Pi Campus, we wanted to provide support, mentorship, and network to startups that use applied AI across several verticals. Pi Campus keeps growing with 52 investments so far, and the startups are hitting some um, big milestones. We are very proud to support these initiatives and we will continue to invest in talents that bring a real impact in this world. Uh, let's look uh, at some of the latest achievements of some of the, some of the Pi campus startups. And to do so, um, I'm very glad to uh, invite Sébastien Bratier, who is director of the School of AI, to present a few of these amazing enterprises. Please, Sébastien. Everyone, very great to, to have you tonight. It's my pleasure as well to welcome you to the to pitch day. So let me give you a few uh, bits and pieces of uh, news from uh, Pi Campus. Um, so many of you know us, but let me just uh, uh, remind everyone what Pi Campus is. So Pi Campus is this uh, venture fund that uh, Isa and Marco created. Um, depending on how you count, indeed 55 investments um, so what Pi Campus does is it takes, uh, it, it gives the uh, startups uh, uh, some money between 50 and 500,000 euros, and then in return takes a share of their investments. Um, many of the investments we do are based in Italy, and then the rest is uh, across Europe, um, several in the UK and also in Cambridge, and then a, a large number in the US too. So the latest um, investments, I'll, I'll, I want to speak about uh, Metaphor. That's one that um, was done at uh, Y Combinator, the batch of summer 21, so a couple of months ago. So Metaphor is a startup that uses, you might have heard of them, uh, foundational models, very large language models. And in fact, they've, they're creating a language model called Wanderer 2, which is trained on 2.5 uh, million hacker news items. Uh, so it's a very specific language model that is used, if you will, as a search engine for um, web content, mostly. That's the application that they're building it on. So here you see on the, on the screen here on the slide, 
examples of how this is supposed to work. Um, so it's a, it's a search engine that you can specify exactly the kind of content you're after and, and you get that. So this is a metaphor. And then another one in a very different domain, uh, Turion Space uh, is focused on uh, a very different mission, which is to collect space debris and put uh, commercial satellites back into the orbit in which they belong to. So this is a, Turin has a very long reaching mission or vision of um, doing mining on asteroids that we have in the solar system, but they're starting their mission or their work with a smaller, uh, smaller scale mission, which is to take care of the immediate spatial surroundings of earth. And this is uh, something you can, you can check out on their website too. Okay, and after these news from uh, PyCampus, I'd like to hand over to Cristiano, um, who's our lead scientist at, at Pi School, and he'll give us some news from uh, Pi School. Hi all, uh, thank you, Seb. I welcome you again. I'm Cristiano, the leading coach uh, at Pi School. Uh, I will uh, like now to present you some recent works we have done here. You see at Pi School, in addition to the School of AI, we are working uh, also on other on some other uh, very cool projects. In particular, we like to apply AI to impactful challenges. So people in general call this field AI for good. I will briefly tell you about this, uh, this project that makes us particularly proud. The project is called uh, Patents for uh, uh, Industrial Pollution Prevention and Control and was done in collaboration with the Joint Research Center, GRC of the European Union. Um, you see, during this project, we leveraged natural language processing to achieve environmental sustainability. Uh, how? Building a semantic retrieval engine for research and development documents based on state-of-the-art uh, architecture like transformer models. Um, research and development documents, you can think about papers, scientific papers, and technology, technology patents. Um, you see, the final goal of this project uh, is to geographically map uh, European environmental capabilities. And if you want to uh, know more about it, uh, you are interested, you can check this blog post and uh, Lucia after can, uh, can put it in, in the chat so you can, you can easily view it. Um, so Seb, go to the next slide, please. About this, uh, this project, there is, a, let's say, a curiosity about this project. On the right, you can see this official document by the European Commission that um, in, it's underlined in blue. They allowed us to open source our software. Um, on the left, instead, you can, you can see that we have our, our um, own project on the official repository of the official GitHub. Of, uh, of the European Commission, you see, European Commission Joy Research Center. And you see, this is very, <laughs> it's a very good achievement. The, pro the project is open source released and with open access. We have also a report. You can check everything in the link that uh, I told you before and Lucia will post in the chat. But the very good news is that uh, the Joint Research Center was uh, so satisfied about uh, this project that uh, wanted a follow up and they are supporting us for the next month, let's say. So we will, we will finish the, this project in, in one month and we are happy to, to do it. So next slide. Thank you. We, thanks to this project, I must say, we were invited at several talks in the last, uh, let's say, four to five months. One talk was a meetup here in Italy by the community Deep Learning Italia. Then we were present and invited in a very cool uh, workshop and conference, which is called AI for People. And uh, let's say a couple of days ago, we were uh, in Krakow online, okay, not in present, but we were online in Krakow for a meetup uh, in the community of deeplearning.ai. Uh, that's about the um, patents for industrial pollution prevention and control. 
And instead, uh, during session nine, uh, we hosted, so during this session of the School of AI, we hosted a series of talks, uh, really interesting. We had uh, guests speaking about uh, ex explanatory learning, uh, big science initiatives, so open source project. Uh, we had Emanuela talking about AI policy, and then we also had a very technical uh, talk on uh, the transformers and their future in, in natural language processing. You can check everything I said, and also the tech talks, you can read about them in the link below. So now I, I'm... I leave uh, the floor again to, to Sebastian. And thank you so much. See you later. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Cristiano. And I, in turn, would like to say a few words about essentially how Pi School of AI works. So today is pitch day um, for a session of Pi School. And in every session, we have essentially the same format. What we do at Pi School is that we organize this encounter between, on the one hand, sponsoring companies on the other one, uh, fellows, and lastly, mentors. So, and, and we're in the middle, this is why I, I drew a nice triangle on this slide to explain the, the mechanism. Sponsors, that's, uh, that's companies that come with a business problem to us. And we, on the other hand, select uh, fellows through a process that is essentially like, uh, like technical recruitment. So it's many of the people on the, the call here um, I have recognized so many names, alumni, the fellows of this session. So they're engineers in uh, artificial intelligence, in machine learning, in natural language processing, computer vision. So people with a background in AI. And um, we, we give them, we prepare for them, we assign them to uh, projects that we have worked out with the sponsors. We call these projects challenges to underscore the fact that uh, often enough they're um, I would say bets, their hypotheses that we're trying to validate. And we put them in touch with uh, a specialist, uh, usually a research scientist, someone who knows the vertical in AI really well, and that's the, that's the mentor. So what it looks like is uh, like on this slide, um, what comes from the sponsoring organization is a business pain. And by that, you know, I'm speaking kind of like startup slang here. Business pain means really um, an issue, something that needs to be solved. And the hypothesis that we're going after, that we're trying to check, is that we can uh, fix this pain, fix this problem using AI algorithms and using that data that they have for us. We apply the state of the art of AI and machine learning. Uh, as a matter of fact, for instance, you'll, you'll, you'll figure out that the very first pitch that we have, the, I realized that the publication we're using um, is from just three months ago. And um, we, we use this state of the art and the sort of you know, tricks and techniques that we know about, also with the help of the mentors, within a time box of eight weeks. Okay, so it's we know when it starts, we exactly know when it finishes. And as a matter of fact, it finishes today for session nine. And out comes a proof of concept that returns to the hands of the, of the sponsoring company. And they have full intellectual property of that and then um, do what, what they feel is relevant. So that means they integrate it maybe in a platform. Uh, they do some work to put it into their standard services. Some of our sponsors also um, want to make the resulting proof of concept open source. And this is really nice because then it ends up on the GitHub uh, or the repository of uh, Pi School, where you can actually check out a large number of projects for which the sponsor has chosen to make them open source. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the two projects we did with the European Space Agency, I spotted the Sabrina on the call from ESA. Well, these ended up as open source projects. And that's a really cool thing when you can do that. So that's how Pi School of AI works. And now to speak about this in, in more concrete terms, uh, on our call today, I'd like to welcome also Andrea, Andrea Cosentini, uh, who is the head of data science and AI at uh, Intesa San Paolo, the, the Italian bank. Hi, Andrea. Hi, hi, Sebastian. Thank you hi. for inviting me. Hey. So we, we figured, uh, Andrea, it would, be, it would be really cool if you could, um, it's the first time we're doing this on pitch day, but we thought it would be a really good idea if someone on the other side could say a few words about the experience 
at uh, Pi So sure. do you mind? So here I've put, you know, on the slide, I've tried to illustrate sort of like very at a high, very high level what went on in yeah. the in the challenge um, that that you proposed, that uh, Banca Intesa proposed. Yeah. Do you mind saying a few words about uh, maybe the business context and what all of this means? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, yes, our interest was uh, about a possible synergy uh, with one of, the, of uh, our center project started a few months uh, earlier. Uh, the problem was uh, to identify mentions of company names in public class releases um, and, uh, and match them in our customer database. That's more difficult than, uh, than it looks uh, um, because many company names are identical uh, or very similar. Ferrari in this slide, for example, you, you know Ferrari is fucking wines uh, or Ferrari in automotive or Ferrari Parmigiano. And uh, so they uh, can only be uh, disambiguated from contest. Uh, um, so this was uh, our, our, um, our business contest. Okay, cool, that's nice. And so um, I remember that on, uh, on the session uh, where we had this uh, challenge, one of your team members, uh, Giacomo, joined so that's a, a, an employee of uh, Banca Intesa, just to make sure. He joined on the team in Pi School uh, who, who worked on this project. Um, do you have any feedback on how he liked the experience? Well, yeah, uh, it was a very great experience for Giacomo, uh, which uh, then uh, shared learnings in that team. Um, he gained a lot of experience and beans from uh, well-known uh, AI mentors and from uh, all the attendees. Um, Giacomo uh, pursued a well-organized schedule and benefited from uh, an international environment in Pest school. And uh, he enjoyed uh, inspiring uh, talks and workshops. So, um... Okay, so the I'm, I'm going back now to the to the challenge itself and to the topic. So we had this issue. So for your platform, we had this issue of matching uh, mentions of company names in in press releases to accounts, well, to uh, to customers of the bank, right? Yeah. And this is what yeah. I have put on this slide here to say: okay, you you have these press release sentences, Alcoa Corporation, you match it up to a to an account and so forth. And, yeah, exactly. and at the bottom, I remember I, I took the example from the um, from the brief that we put together, and we had this example. If you remember back then, two, two years back, Ferrari, which in Italy is both a car maker and a prosecco maker. So we had yeah. this the running example for what was hard in discriminating, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cars and prosecco, nice to discriminate. And also Parmigiano, there is a Parmigiano producer that is uh, Ferrari. Okay. You didn't know that. So, um, yeah, so this is, so, and eventually the team produced, uh, um, produced a prototype to do exactly this job. And so uh, can you say a word about what happened afterwards? So what happened with the prototype? Did it end up being forgotten or did you use it? Where is no, it? Okay. No, thank you for this question. It went. Uh, first of all, Giacomo and his uh, teammates implemented in Pay School um, code scripts in Python from data preparation to uh, neural network uh, neural network model. And uh, then, after eight weeks, they got an MVP, industrialized it uh, afterwards. Um, so it was a, a success. And you could you could uh, integrate it. So the MVP, you your uh, Giacomo maybe in person or your teams could integrate it into yeah. some we larger we platform. The, 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 this MVP in our systems and uh, now is uh, is running. Wow. Okay. So that's really cool to hear. And so uh, at a at an organizational level, and maybe you also at an individual level, level at the, you know, as the head of data science in, in, in Tesa San Paolo. So what did you get out of the entire thing? What did you find interesting? Oh, yeah, it was very, 
it was a, a, a very valuable uh, experience for us and for me in particular. I had a continuous interaction with the team, with uh, weekly meetings uh, for feedbacks and alignment. Um, uh, we were able to leverage the knowledge, sharing uh, this knowledge with uh, all my team. And, um, and I noticed that, that uh, the, your organization, the Pi School, uh, Sebastian, was conscious of factors driving our business and also impact of uh, technical choices on uh, business value. Thanks. So that's uh, good points for us. I'm, I'm glad it worked out really well for you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andrea, for taking the time. Thanks for joining today also. So now I guess um, we're moving on in our agenda and um, I'll, I'll leave the floor to Maite to introduce the, the important part of the, of the meeting. Yes, thank you, Sebastian. Okay, yes, we are ready for the uh, highlight of this event, which are the pitches by the fellows. And to get us started, we are going to go with the first challenge uh, tackled by fellows Saswat Malik and Nabil Raza. So, guys, the virtual floor is yours. Um, good luck. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, Saswat, you should be able to speak now and take control of the slides if you like, or you tell, you ask me to. Um, hi, all. Um, so, um, we often find ourselves working in environments with a lot of uh, background noise. So, imagine yourself uh, having to cover your microphone during, during a business meeting and just to be audible. This is because uh, traditional microphones are highly susceptible to picking up the ambient sounds and hence uh, aren't quite well suited for such uh, noisy conditions. In such cases, having a noise cancellation microphone is not just an option, it becomes a priority. Uh, these are uh, there are noise cancelling microphones available which uh, go on long way in filtering out the background uh, noise but are quite expensive uh, they also have an additional energy footprint to support the hardware uh, concerned with the filtering so uh, this is uh, a brief excerpt from a recent uh, seven year uh, market trend study on noise cancelling microphones uh, as you can see it has a projected uh, compound annual growth rate of 14% and has been a major investment avenue by leading hardware manufacturers. But our objective is not to work on noise cancellation. Instead, our solution is to capture signals only from, uh, from the speaker and avoid ambient noise. This can be done using a bone conduction microphone, which is applied directly to the skin. It picks up the vibrations of the skull while produced while we speak, but it doesn't pick up the ambient noise. On the downside, the signal we get through bone conduction is very degraded and needs to be processed in very particular ways to be interpreted. To make use of bone conductor speech signal, we tackle the problem following two tasks. Uh, command classification, where we try to map the recorded speech command to one of the 20 predefined commands and speech reconstruction, where we record bone conductor speech and output the speech that sounds as, as natural as regular air conducted speech. We had two additional hurdles to play, uh, face on our challenge. We had to collect our own training data corresponding to the specific hardware we were working on. And we wanted to deploy on a low resource edge device, which meant we had to apply special techniques to reduce the memory and computational footprint of our algorithms. The bone conducted input is converted into a spectrogram. A pre-trained neural network is then used to learn the features described by the image and then predict the class of the utterance. The model is an interpretation from this paper and published only three months ago. This, uh, so uh, Sebastian, could you please play uh, the degraded signal?
Saswat, anything? Uh, yeah, well, um, I didn't get the audio, but anyway. Uh, so this is what. Oh, maybe I can try to... play it for you if you like. Sure, please play it. Ah, uh, this one here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's try that. So this is what a typical boat conducted signal sounds like. And uh, uh, the command on the right, find, find a place to bring. This is the command with which we expect the model to um, predict. So waveforms are represented as spectrograms. Uh, essentially on the horizontal axis, we see time. And on the vertical axis, we see frequencies. The color is more intense where there is a stronger spectrum power. In this way, we have converted the problem of classifying utterances into classifying images. And neural networks are really strong at this. You can see from the yellow rectangles how the bone conduction signal is missing the high frequency components. Um, Sebastian, you could play the audio, individual audio clips. Go to the previous song. Go to the previous song. Turn the volume. Turn the volume. Turn the volume. Okay. In the reconstruction task, we feed in the bone conductor signals, which gets converted into a spectrogram, and an autoencoder neural network learns to reconstruct the air conducted equivalent signals. So, uh, how we expect the in uh, input uh, audio is uh, smashed in with the plate. Uh, this was the input to the network and uh, our uh, the predicted model output was uh, find the place to drink so uh, regarding the classification task we obtain a quite uh, quite a good uh, utterance classification accuracy we managed to recognize a command out of 10, 20 commands for any speaker on speech uh, reconstruction two, the performance of a algorithm is decent. The leftmost plot is the input, the middle one is the predicted output, and the rightmost plot is the expected result. As you can see, our model's output is quite close to the desired ground truth. So uh, I'm Thashit, a recent undergraduate from BID Chennai. I'm passionate about deep learning and using it for solving real world problems. Nabil is my teammate. He has a master's in data science and has an interest in computer vision. Uh, we have the right profile to work on this challenge because we hail from an electronics background and share com common interests in computer vision. Thanks to our mentor, Simone, an assistant professor in uh, Rome. He does research in deep learning applied to audio. Simone helped us solve uh, several technical problems that came up during this challenge. So um, that was a project in brief. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Thanks, Aswat, for the uh, interesting presentation. By the way, uh, hi, everyone. I'm, my name is Francesco Gariaggi. I was the coach for this um, particular challenge. So I wanted to spend a few words on, on Nabil uh, and Saswat. Um, um, so as uh, Saswat um, mentioned, apart from the technical effort in coming up with the, uh, the two models for uh, command classification and the speech reconstruction, uh, Nabil and Saswat also made major contributions in the data collection front because uh, they had to basically uh, build their own training data set. And what they did was to um, set up a particular hardware platform um, for collecting data and uh, also defining uh, a full-blown data collection protocol that they uh, then use to actually build the data set. Um, not only that, because they also involved several people in this process. Uh, we're talking about people of different ages, uh, different gender and also different um, English accents. And they also used uh, data augmentation techniques to make up for the, uh, the low amount of data that 
they were able to collect uh, this way. And finally, um, kind of as an engineering effort, which is normally not requested in these kinds of challenges, I would say. Um, they also developed two uh, self-contained demonstrators, uh, two software demonstrators, actually hardware demonstrators, uh, based on a resource-constrained edge device um, that can be used for real-time testing of the two models for classification and speech reconstruction. So thanks again, um, Nabil and Saswat. Now I'd like to um, leave the floor to Daniele, which will talk about the project, a challenge um, sponsored by Innovation Engineering and, and will cover um, computer-assisted query construction. Over to you, Daniele. Thank you, Francesco. So I'm, I'm going to present my, um, our challenge uh, that is computer assisted uh, query construction. So the, um, the challenge was proposed by, um, by Innovation Engineering, that is an innovation specialist company. And um, their main product is uh, Wisby. Wisby is um, a massive search engine that, let, um, that lets the user interact uh, uh, retrieve and get insights from a large number of documents. A large number of documents related to innovation that range from patents to papers to projects. And uh, this is possible thanks to a powerful tool, a powerful indexing tool that is uh, Apache Solar. The only problem, um, let's say, about uh, this kind of indexing is that uh, the only the user can query the system uh, to the mean of a special kind of query, that is the solar query. The solar query is, um, is um, as I said, a special kind of query based on keywords connected with the Boolean operators, so OR and AND. Um, this, uh, the generation, the construction of this query is, um, is very often time consuming and uh, quite uncomfortable for the users. In fact, the user has to figure out uh, all the concept, uh, the, all the concepts uh, that uh, have to be included in the um, in the query. Then, for each concept, uh, um, the user has to be sure to include all the synonyms. Otherwise, uh, some relevant documents may be left out from the um, from the search. And um, in many real cases, to before getting to a um, complete solar query, so to a good solar query, the user has to repeat uh, the, um, the process of querying a lot of times. And each time it has to manually figure out uh, from the documents, um, from the results, uh, what are the keywords that he missed. He has to add these keywords again in the query and go with the, with the next query, so with the next search. Moreover, um, all the generation of this kind of query um, is possible, even if time consuming, if the user has a broad domain knowledge about uh, the topic. Otherwise, uh, for, uh, for a non-expert user, it uh, is even impossible to get a good query. So, we, um, the solution that we are bringing to this problem is basically um, in shifting the user experience from the generation of the Boolean keyword query to a natural language description of the search. And um, yeah, we choose the natural language because it's the most familiar way that uh, humans uh, have to communicate. Um, this is what the solution looks like. So this is the interface that we have developed to help the user in the query construction. So at the beginning, the user inputs uh, the um, natural language description of the search, in this case, renewable energy and autonomous cars. Then uh, once um, the user click on the get suggestions button, um, there are um, uh, there are shown some uh, suggestions. So the first one in the word cloud are the contextual suggestions. 
So these are concepts, these are suggestions that are um, related to the entire phase. So suggestions that, that uh, take um, um, into account the whole input. Then we have also um, some suggestions based on each concept that our system has identified in the natural language input. So in this case, our system has identified the two different concepts, the, the, the renewable energy and autonomous cars. And for each of these concepts um, are provided some suggestions. Then the user can um, manually pick some words, can manually select the concepts, the keywords, and they are automatically added in the solar query. So eventually you will, um, you will get the complete solar query. And uh, the um, concepts from the word cloud are added with the end operator, while the concepts uh, uh, from a specific concept are added with the or operator linked to, to, to that concept. So we achieved uh, um, this result with a complex um, architecture. So starting from a natural language um, input, firstly, it's called an API uh, that we have deployed that we, we call the Synonyms API that is in charge of identifying every concept in the natural language input. And for each concept, um, find, finds a list of suggestions that are then sent to the interface and are shown to the, to the user. On the other end, there, are, um, there is the, the second API, that is the contextual API, that is in charge of providing the contextual suggestions. So the suggestions that are displayed in the, in the word cloud. Um, so also in this case, uh, the list of suggestions are sent to the interface uh, and every suggestion has a score. So based on the score, the word cloud um, assign a font size to the keyword. And the, in this case, the, if the user select some of these concepts, they are added to the solar query with the end operator. We, we can go more in detail about each API. So the synonyms API is the synonym API work, works in two different phases. In the first phase, there are there is the, the identification of each concept. And uh, for doing this, we use the Jensen Fraser tool. Then the concept is sent to a word to vec model that um, gives uh, a list of suggestions for that specific concept. And uh, um, this word to vec was uh, pre-trained by us on, the, on a large corpus of papers from uh, WSB database. Um, the other API, the contextual API, um, has a little bit more complex pipeline. There is a first phase that we, um, that we refer as the semantic search that is in charge of identifying the, the top K most similar documents with respect to your natural language input. And um, this um, similarity is computed using uh, um, the embeddings so a numerical uh, vectors for um, um, between the natural language input and each documents in the um, in the WSB platform, basically. So um, at this point, uh, we have selected the in our case the top hundred most similar documents. Um, so we used uh, at this point we used the two different techniques in parallel that are text rank and keyword to extract keywords from the, um, the aggregated text of these top 100 most similar documents. Um, and again, we have another step that is the, the ranking of the keywords because the output of text ranking keyword is a large number of concepts taken directly from the documents. Then we rank each concept using the cuisine distance between the embeddings of the concept and the natural language input, and we send to we send to the um, to the interface so to, to the word cloud the top twenty um, keywords, the top twenty concepts. 
So we um, eventually, starting from a brief natural language description, we, um, we managed to generate a complete solar query without manually typing a single keyword in the solar query box. And uh, um, this possible thanks to our uh, pipeline that, that is a combination of um, state-of-the-art model from different tasks combined together in a single, um, in a single pipeline that um, basically led the user to do this mapping between uh, natural language and uh, solar query. Thank you, thank you for the attention. This is the team. Um, it's Priyanshu from, uh, from India and uh, me. And a special thanks goes to our mentor, Gabriele, that really helped us in um, finding the best solution and uh, the very state-of-the-art model that we integrated in our pipeline. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Daniela, for the presentation. Hi, Cristiano, here again. I was the Pi School coach for, for this challenge. Uh, so a couple of comments. Uh, this team was able really to build uh, from the first week a demonstrator API using React and Flask of what they were doing, uh, they were developing. That was super useful because the sponsor was always updated on our progress and therefore they could give frequent feedbacks. Um, this helped a lot to build up everything extremely fast and concretely. The team uh, also applied a really, I must say, a wide range of natural language processing approaches from a standard one like keywords to more advanced one like semantic search and synonyms generation. Some of the natural language processing tool they used, uh, let's uh, mention some of them, Jensim, it's a very standard one, word to vec but also sentence birth like models, text rank and spacey. The team managed to, interfa to interface all these tools, which is remarkable, really. It's worth noting that the team worked from a time zone, very different time zones from India to California, with a sponsor, a stakeholder located in Italy. I must say this was very cool. So thank you, Daniela and all the team. Uh, now I will um, give the floor to Lucas that will describe our other innovation engineering challenge. So uh, Lucas, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Cristiano. Hi everyone, I'm Lucas. I'm one of the fellows of the School of EI this, this session. And I want to talk a little to you, to you guys about our, our challenge. Our challenge was also sponsored by Innovation Engineering and it's called Semantic, the Semantic Taxonomy Builder. So uh, what is the Semantic Taxonomy Builder and what we want to do with that? Uh, to talk about that, uh, we also want to talk a little about WSB. And the WSB is a platform that they, they provide. And it's a, tech, it's a platform that basically provides insights on any given technology. Uh, so if the user wants to know anything about nanotechnology, let's say, uh, the platform is, is gonna retrieve a lot of information about that. Uh, so what's the problem then? Uh, the problem here is that this information comes in from many different sources and it's organized in many different data sets. Uh, if you guys see in green, each data source, it's gonna come with a native label. And this lab those labels don't really map very well across themselves. Uh, on top of that, many of the documents they have doesn't have those, those labels at all. Uh, so it's simply impossible to, to explore different taxonomies from any, anything that you query basically. Uh, uh, a little uh, more on the mix, uh, we call it, uh, this is not the final view of it. They, they just keep adding more data, more data sources, more data sets. So uh, it's a big problem now. It's gonna be a very big, it's, it's gonna be much bigger later on. Uh, so what's the solution that we're proposing here? Uh, we are proposing that we shouldn't rely on the taxonomy provided by the source. Uh, we should instead uh, use that information to build our own taxonomy. 
So what, that, what does that mean? Uh, it means that we'll be able to classify any document with any of the labels. At least uh, that's the plan. So just a little on, uh, on the data itself, you guys can see there, uh, patents usually will come with CPC and categories, labels, and other, other types of documents are gonna come with fields of study, AHAC, and those are the ones that don't really match very well, very well across themselves. Uh, so uh, what's the value that will bring? Why we want to do that? Why we want to have a, a common taxonomy? Well, uh, first a system like that can label millions of documents in an instant. That's something that uh, no human could do. Uh, and this will be, uh, will be used to create a cross uh, data set taxonomy. Also, this is a system that can be kept online so any other document that comes into the platform will be able to be labeled instantly. And that aims to reduce, greatly reduce the manual work, even for the end user who is trying to find a, specific, a technology in a specific uh, sector, let's say, uh, that can help. Him. And also it, it can create new ways of analyzing technologies into taxonomy groups. You know, it's something that we currently cannot do. Uh, so a little about the steps that we are taking to achieve that. Uh, we separate in four different steps, which is gonna be first finding the labels, find potential labels inside of the data sets, then calculating the embeddings for the documents, which is basically a numerical representation of the text, text on the document. Then we can use that to calculate the labels on the native data set, the data set that the label belongs to, and then hopefully uh, exploit the same method to cross-correlate those data sets. So basically label data sets with labels that don't belong there. They are not native to that data set. So how we, how we do that? Let's talk about the steps then. The first step is finding the labels. Finding labels is very easy. There is plenty to choose from on the platform. Uh, so for instance, there are ASJC for papers, CPC for patents, sector for grants, you name it. There's plenty of them. Uh, we are taking uh, ASJC as our Example here, but it could be any of them. ASJCs are pretty good because they are global standard for, for labeling papers, but even then, some of the some a lot of the paper, millions of them, doesn't have the label at all. So good, we got the labels, uh, we went to the embeddings. Uh, embeddings are numerical representations of the title, abstract, and things like that from the documents. And we actually leveraging a state-of-the-art algorithm uh, embedding system from Alien AI Institute of artificial intelligence called Spectre and uh, basically tailored that to our needs. So after that, we have the labels, we have the embeddings, uh, what we can do with that. Uh, we actually can train the model with, the, with, those, uh, with those things. Uh, on the middle of the picture, you can see there is a ASJC model. That's the model that we use that to train. And it actually can label unlabeled papers in this case with ASJC codes. So you take a paper, you create embeddings, pass through our model, and it's gonna label this, that paper for you with the, with the ASJC. Uh, the table on the right is the actual scores from some of the models that we tried. Uh, if you see the, the highlighted one, uh, we, we got around 70% of accuracy in a top 10 uh, labels, label suggestions which means that uh, for any paper that we fit this model, the correct label, it's gonna be on the top 10. Uh, a little examples on the, the bottom table. Uh, if you see, uh, the, there's the original labels and the suggested labels. Usually the label, the correct label is there, but even when it's not, if you check the other labels, it all makes sense in a semantic way. So it, it belongs to the same taxonomy. So we think that's a pretty good result. <laughs> Uh, what else we can do with this model? Now that we have a, a model trained to calculate ASJCs, we don't have to stop there. We can actually go and label the other data sets with the same technique. So in this case, we're taking the patents and passing through our, train, our model trained on papers, and we're going to get ASJCs for the patents, which is something that's not native to this data set. So this will allow us to label documents uh, in, in non-native taxonomies from that particular, uh, particular data set. So uh, anyway, this, uh, this is the team. It's me, Havindra. I'm from Brazil. Havindra is from India. So we are speaking from across the globe here. 
And I want to give a special thanks for our mentor, Alberto, which helped us a lot. So Alberto, thank you very much. Without you, this couldn't be done. So that's it, guys. Th thank you very much. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, yeah, Cristiano again, I also coach uh, this challenge. So we are showing you uh, what uh, Lucas just mentioned. And we are showing you the final result, but actually this team started off with a really completely different challenge. It was on trends analysis related, let's say, to time series. We had um, weekly calls with the stakeholders like the usual pay school challenge, but this time it was ex exceptionally useful. After six weeks, we realized that uh, due to the data we had and property of the challenge we had, identified at the beginning, we couldn't make progress. We were stuck. So we agreed with uh, innovation engineering to pivot and we defined a new challenge uh, on taxonomy mapping, the one that Lucas just uh, talked about. It was um, useful to have our mentor Alberto by our side. Um, it was very helpful in mitigating the issues with uh, pivoting. I think uh, this is important, I want to highlight it. You see, in data science, uh, it, it's often, it often happens to change plans uh, and you should be comfortable with it. At Pi School, we are proud to be able to select uh, the best fellows and put uh, in our competencies to help them. So thank you, Lucas, again. And now I will uh, leave the floor to Adrian to speak about the 101% challenge. So Adrian, go ahead. Thank you so much, Cristiano. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Adrian, and together with Davide, we're super excited to present a project which we've done together in partnership with 101%. Uh, so quickly, before we talk about our challenge, a quick note of our sponsor. 101% is the first Italian AAA uh, games developer and an animation studio. Besides games, they also create bespoke animations and custom virtualized environments, uh, either a B2B or B2C channel. Um, their games are great. Go check them out. So quick note on the context of this challenge. As you can imagine, the value, the market cap of global video games market has been exponentially increasing. Uh, as you can see from the graph on the left, these are only the 2020 are only the uh, expectations or the projections, which are actually much, much higher due to the coronavirus pandemic, which has had an immediate and huge boost on the gaming development. Uh, so the market is huge and cons constantly growing. But on the other side, you can also see that um, the cost of creating video games and animation in general is also exponentially increasing. I'd like to point out in the attention that uh, the y-axis is exponential or logarithmic and not linear. So uh, two of these bars is essentially a hundredfold increase in production cost of a single game. So we see this as a huge opportunity. And this is the context during which Centuno um, Percento reached out to us to try to fix. So one particular point in here that we can try to tackle is um, the pipeline of animating characters. So in very quick, uh, very quick note, how the animation pipeline looks like uh, from a video game house is that you start with a script, then you have to hire an actor to reenact the script that then, it then gets automatically converted into a 3D facial animation of a character, which then has to be manually fixed by an animator and needs to be corrected for some small errors. And then at the end, um, such animation is then vo voiced over by a professional voiceover actor. And as you can imagine, this solution is expensive and time consuming. You need multiple people integrating together. And another problem of this is that scripts now suddenly become static objects that cannot be very easily changed since every change to the script requires this pipeline to be moved from the beginning to the end again. So you need to rehire the actor, redo the animation. And this is, of course, a big problem. So where we come in? is right in the middle of this pipeline with our collaboration. We try to create a machine learning model that automatically takes a script and turns it into a realistic looking animation. So how do we do this? 
So let's re-specify this problem a little bit in a little bit more detail. Given a particular speech, given a particular script and a particular tone and emotion, we need to reconstruct an unbelievable looking animation. The way we do this is we first convert the script to a piece of audio using a text-to-speech, and then we create a custom bespoke model that converts speech to realistic looking animation. So here's our model architecture. Um, so from the first challenge, you are already accustomed to what male spectrograms look like. It's essentially a visual representation of our audio. Uh, and as you can see on the X axis, you can see time. And on the Y axis, you can see the frequency activations of that particular sound. We use this as an input into our bespoke machine learning model. For those of you who are interested, it's uh, some combination of a convolutional neural network with batch normalization and a dense layer at the end of it, which in the end comes out looking as a series of parameter activations, which then control our animation, uh, well, our facial animation of our model. So in this particular uh, case, you can see only a very small sample of these parameters. There's actually 140 of them. However, for readability, you can only see a sample of 10. Uh, changing over time. So here are our results so far. When is Lina's birthday? Not sure. In a couple of days, she'd been saving for two tickets. She managed to get hold of your phone and address. That's how I had your number. Now, we're extremely uh, excited about these results. We already believe that uh, they look very realistic and can definitely have commercialization potential. Uh, we, of course, do believe that there is um, more work to be done. However, the results we already have are very, very promising. Um, quick note on the literature. As I said before, the, our, our model was bespoke. Uh, because of the particular business requirements of first starting with text and then converting it into 3D parameters of a, um, of a particular animation character, we believe that the bespoke solution would suit us best. However, we did, of course, base ourselves on literature and we used state-of-the-art um, papers to guide our um, architecture design. A quick note on the workflow, because I believe it's a, it's besides an interesting machine learning challenge, I also believe it's a very, very interesting engineering challenge. So I'd love, I'd love to take a minute to quickly talk about this. We have to start with a 3D animation software, such as Maya. Uh, the first step we need to do is to actually extract the animations from the file. So we have custom scripts to extract our animations from, uh, from the custom 3D model, turn it into a JSON format. Then we do, um, alongside taking with the auto, uh, we do custom pre-processing using a stack of different uh, tools and techniques to turn it into a uh, final usable audio format, which gets stored as our database in HDF file, um, which we then use as input to our custom bespoke model. We use TensorFlow and Keras to train that model. After we have a trained model, we can then feed any audio sample, or as a matter of fact, we can feed any text sample using a text-to-speech model beforehand and feed it into our model to produce reliable uh, looking animations, which of course, at the end, we need to feed back directly into the 3D rendering software to view the results, which you saw a couple of slides before. So that's it. Um, I'm Adrian, and together with Davido, we've been working on this project. It's been very exciting. Uh, so thank you for Cento and Opercento for providing us with this opportunity. I'd also like to speak a few words about our mentor, Timo Bolkart, whose guidance uh, has been instrumental in completing this project. So thank you so much, Timo. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Adrian. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm João. I'm from Pi School, and I coach the team on this project. And I would like to say a few words about it. So, essentially, this actually is a second iteration of a project that started in the previous session of the School of AI. And in this session, the the the, the two fellows, David and Adrian, they set out to improve the previously existing solution, which unfortunately had some expressivity and lip sync issues. Um, this uh, was um, a very difficult uh, challenge since uh, the data that uh, Adrian and David had to work with uh, was quite complex and it was difficult to learn how to manipulate and extract all the necessary information from it. And in addition, the Adrian and David also had to work with uh, advanced 3D development software, which is not very easy to, to use and has a, a difficult uh, learning curve. Um, one thing I actually uh, found, find worthy of note that happened during this project that is something that ideally should happen in every project was the fact that uh, Adrian and Davide managed to help Cento no Percento with the data generation process. And they did this by creating a script which reduced the number of iterations between PySchool and Cento no Percento during this uh, data generation uh, phase. Um, in the end, actually, David and Adrian managed, as, you, as you've seen from their presentation, to create a very convincing solution, a very com, uh, convincing proof of concept, which I believe marked a landmark on a commercially viable product. So even though that this is not ready directly for production and to be used uh, straight away uh, commercially, I think this was really a stepping stone on, on, that, uh, on that direction. And uh, I, I'm quite happy about the results that were obtained. So thank you for listening and uh, over to you, Maite. Thank you, Joao. And wow, congratulations to all the fellows on achieving such incredible results with their projects. And thank you to all the companies that were involved with their challenges. A big thank you also to the mentors who assessed and advised the teams. They've been mentioned before, but here again, Alberto Danese, Simone Scarp. Skardapane, Timo Bolkart, and Gabriele Sardi. Thank you so much. And to the fellows who are now part of the Pi School community, we will remain here to support you in your professional path. So we wish you great success. As part of the Pi School team, I would like to say that it is quite an honor to work with such wonderful people and professionals. I would like to thank everyone working front and back of the house, making sure the School of AI runs smoothly from day one until today. So thank you, Isabel, Sebastian, Cristiano, Joao, Francesco, Lucia, and Elena. One important bit of news, the next session of the School of AI, session 10, is set to start on Pi Day 2022. That means March 14th for the lay people in the audience, such as myself. If you're interested in participating as a fellow, or if you think your company has a challenge that AI can solve, let us know, drop us a line, and we'll be happy to discuss and study the possibilities. And this is it. Session nine of School of AI is officially over. What a journey. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and we hope to see you soon at our home in Rome. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great one. Bye-bye.